Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Trapped by Love. I'm your host, Emma Carrington. This podcast covers cases of domestic abuse and domestic homicide. So if that's not the kind of content that you're looking for, I completely understand. Thanks for stopping by. My aim in covering these cases is to honour the victims of these crimes and to get their stories out there in the hopes of warning others who may find themselves in similar situations. So in saying that, I mean absolutely no disrespect to any of the victims or their loved ones. I've done my very best to thoroughly research these cases and to get the details as accurate as possible. The hope is that the more people who recognise the red flags and warning signs of abusive relationships, the less prevalent these cases will be in the future. Knowledge is power and we need to know what to be on the lookout for so we can protect ourselves and each other. I'd also like to ask you a quick favour. Would you leave a five-star review of Trapped by Love on your favourite podcast directory? It seems so simple, but it really helps us out. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there because a new episode comes out every Friday. Thanks. Now let's go ahead and get into this week's case. This week we'll be discussing the heartbreaking case of Melissa Platt. I decided to cover this case this week because the case has just been reopened, finally. Melissa's family and the true crime community at large have worked tirelessly to have this case reopened and properly investigated. In my opinion, it should never have been closed. But let's get into it and let me know your thoughts on Twitter at LoveTrapPod or pop a comment below. Melissa was born in Houston, Texas on the 3rd of February. 1977 and grew up with her two sisters and her brother. The three girls were extremely close growing up. Her family described Melissa as adventurous and joyful. She enjoyed her job working at McDonald's where she was put in charge of running all the birthday parties. If you remember back to the 90s, if you're 100 years old like me, McDonald's birthday parties were where it was at if you're a kid. And apparently Melissa threw the best of them. She loved kids and went on to move in with her sister in order to help take care of her kids in a kind of nanny capacity. Melissa had so much fun spending time with her sister's kids. In October of 1995, Melissa had her first daughter, Brianna, and then eight years later, in 2003, she had another little girl named Chastity. She loved her girls and was a happy and loving mother. She'd married the girl's father in 2001. However, it was a short-lived marriage and the couple separated in 2005. Around this time, Melissa found herself in some trouble for passing bad checks and wound up on probation. I'm not sure what those circumstances were, but it sounds like her daughters ended up going to live with family on their father's side. Then in 2006, Melissa met a man named Joey Tyndall while she worked at a spare parts store. Then in 2008, they began dating. Now, Joey was not a good guy. He was known to have a history of domestic violence. He'd been married twice before and both his ex-wives were scared of him with good reason. But we'll get back to that shortly. Joey lived in the tiny farming town of Pink Hill, North Carolina. Melissa was totally taken with Joey. She stayed at his trailer most of the time and even ended up getting his name tattooed on her lower back. Their relationship seemed to revolve around alcohol though and where Melissa would previously just enjoy a beer or two, Joey introduced spirits into her drinking and after a while she realised that things were out of her control. She recognised that she had a problem with alcohol so she made the brave decision to get some help and she contacted the Onslow County Behavioural Health Unit in Jacksonville and also the Walter B. Jones Alcohol and Drug Abuse Treatment Centre in Greenville. But Joey didn't support her in her decision to get help and whenever he picked her up from either of these facilities, he would take her straight to a bottle shop. He would tell her she either drank or he would throw her out. She even checked out early from one of her stays due to the threats from Joey. Each time she tried to get sober, his control and manipulation would kick up a notch. He reportedly didn't want her to have a job or a car. He didn't want her to see or talk to her family. He had effectively isolated Melissa and she felt she didn't have anywhere to turn. She felt she had no option but to do what he said because she didn't have anywhere else to go. 
When she did have contact with her family, she hid all that was going on. She made excuses for the bruises. She did eventually open up to her sister and told her of a few incidents. But having been through an abusive relationship personally, I can guarantee no matter how much she disclosed, it would have only been the tip of a very ugly iceberg. Victims downplay and take the blame for everything. Melissa even took the blame for shooting herself, despite the trajectory showing it was a really awkward angle for someone to point a gun towards themselves. However, it wasn't impossible, so the doctors had to take her word for it. And for all of you out there wondering why she would protect him and lie for him, unless you've been in a relationship with someone who utilizes coercive control, manipulation and threats, you can't possibly know the things that you do or say to try to stay safe. This man threatened to kill her on a number of occasions. So if he was the one who shot her, she was obviously going to believe his warning shot and feared any repercussions for telling the truth. Anyway, so for six days from the 3rd of October 2008, Melissa's mum Marion was trying to get in touch with her with no luck. Whenever she called, the call would either go unanswered or Joey would give an excuse as to why Melissa couldn't come to the phone. This concerned her mum. She and Melissa spoke as often as possible, and it was very unusual for a week to go by without her daughter returning her calls. Then, when the answering machine was switched off, she followed her gut feeling that something was really wrong and called in a welfare check to Melissa's probation officer. The probation officer attended the trailer, and when he knocked, there was no answer. He knew that Melissa didn't have a job, but he also knew that she had some medical conditions that would be a cause for concern. So he called Joey to ask if Melissa was okay and also if they could go in to the home to check on her. Joey told him that yes, he could enter the trailer and that Melissa hadn't been doing well, that she'd been drinking a lot and that he'd been struggling to care for her. When the probation officer entered the trailer, he found Melissa laying all but naked on a bare mattress. She had a head and one arm through a t-shirt and she was semi-wrapped in a valance, which is like a, a dust ruffle, sort of wrapped across the top of her body, leaving her lower region exposed. Her body was covered in bruises. She had a black eye, her face was swollen and she couldn't move. The parole officer called for paramedics, tried to wrap Melissa's battered body because he could see that she was shaking violently. He also noticed two drinks beside her, a can with a straw and a cup that on inspection seemed to contain some sort of liquor. The police were also called and in amongst all this chaos, Joey arrived home. Joey hadn't seemed all that concerned when the probation officer had spoken to him earlier, but obviously knew what he was gonna find when he went inside. He obviously wanted to be on hand to give his version of events as soon as possible. Paramedics took in the scene. They were horrified at the state Melissa was in. They didn't just note her injuries, but the fact that they could smell her body fluids from the moment they stepped inside the trailer. Melissa was laying covered in urine, feces, and blood. Joey had been coming and going for a week and just left her there. Melissa was alive, but barely. She was not responsive. She would, however, open her eyes if the paramedics spoke loudly to her. Melissa was taken to the Lenore Memorial Hospital and they did all they could for her. She was bruised from head to toe, deep, dark, new bruises, along with bruises that were in various stages of healing. She had two black eyes, her abdomen and pubic bone were bruised and swollen and her jaw was broken in two places. The inside of her mouth was lacerated and she had damage to and was missing a number of teeth. After performing a CAT scan, they also found an intracranial hemorrhage. After finding all these injuries, the hospital staff realized that she was going to need more help than they could offer. So she was transferred to Pitt County Memorial Hospital in Greenville, North Carolina. They performed an emergency craniotomy to release the pressure on her brain. While performing the surgery, they found a second brain bleed from a separate prior incident. That's two separate injuries that were so severe that they caused bleeding on the brain. 
what this poor woman went through is horrific. The head trauma alone is beyond, but when you take in everything else she also endured, <laughs> poor darling, my heart aches for her. Melissa was not conscious after this surgery until the 17th of October, so she was out for about a week. This is when police came to speak with her, and of course she was on a ton of pain medication and really wasn't all that coherent. At first she'd said that she was in a bad car accident, which of course didn't make any sense, but it could have been a dream or something that her mind fabricated for her to be able to make sense of the immense pain that she was in. But she really had no idea what was going on. After a few more questions, she told the police that she was just clumsy and fell down a lot. It's unclear if she was actively trying to cover for Joey at this time or if she was just so confused from the medication. But my guess is that she'd been warned often enough and had told the lie often enough that she may have even, by this point, just believed that she was just that clumsy. But it was obvious that her injuries weren't from falling down. All the medical personnel who had come into contact with Melissa, from the paramedics to the hospital staff and neurologist at both hospitals, had noted that her injuries were a result of abuse or assault, and yet Joey hadn't been arrested. The family couldn't understand it. When they questioned Detective Braden, the lead detective on the case, if Joey was going to be arrested, at least for negligence, for allowing someone to lay in a state like that for days on end, the detective told them that Joey had been looking after her. He'd given her drinks and fed her. Melissa's sister couldn't understand how they thought that he could have fed her, considering the damage to her jaw. But she was dismissed when she pressed further. Police decided to wait until Melissa healed more to question her further. They went to question Joey, but what really happened was that they had a friendly chat. It really wasn't an interrogation at all, and it didn't even progress to one once the extent of Melissa's injuries obviously didn't line up with his story. Anyway, this is what the police got from talking with Joey. He said that Melissa had sustained her injuries by falling down. He said that on Monday the 29th, he had woken in the middle of the night to find that Melissa was not in bed, and when he went to look for her, he found her outside, naked, intoxicated, and in the back seat of the car. He said it seemed she had fallen because her face was red down one side. So he believed that she had come outside drunk and fallen and struck her face on the concrete and maybe the doghouse, then got into the car and lay there. Not passed out, not asleep, just laying in the car. He said this was the start of her week of being on and off, being bedridden. Then he went on to tell them about her falling and getting stuck in the bathroom on the 3rd of October. Joey told them that when he came home, he saw the bathroom door was shut and the water was running. When he entered the bathroom, he found that the bathtub was overflowing and Melissa was pinned between the tub and the toilet. So he helped her up, cleaned her up and put her to bed. He said her lip and chin appeared to be red from this fall. Marion, Melissa's mum, said that she got a call from Joey about this fall on the night that it happened, but he just said that she had a fall and he put her into bed. He didn't tell her it was anything major or that it was the second time she'd fallen that week, which you would think he'd mention if you were at all concerned. Meanwhile, Melissa was still fighting to overcome her injuries in the hospital. When she underwent yet another surgery, the doctors found necrosis, meaning her brain was basically dying. Melissa also developed a staph infection while in the hospital and then in November she contracted bacterial pneumonia, which further hampered her healing process. She did have moments of lucidity and her family questioned her on what had happened. They asked if someone had hurt her and she said yes. They asked if it was Joey who had hurt her and her face just flooded with terror. She just couldn't bring herself to say that yes, he had. But everyone there that day strongly believed that it was obvious from her fear that this was the case. Marion, her mum, recorded all of this in a journal for authorities. Of course, this was considered hearsay and couldn't be used as evidence. In late November, Melissa went in for another surgery due to hydrocephalus. So she had spinal fluid pooling in her brain. So they needed to relieve the pressure and drain that. 
It was just one thing after another that kept knocking her down. The darling couldn't get a foothold on healing. She started having seizures and these seizures got so bad that they were occurring every couple of minutes. The doctors let the family know that it was extremely unlikely that Melissa was going to recover. So it was on the 17th of December that her family made the heartbreaking decision to take her off life support. Melissa was only 31 years old and had spent the last nine weeks fighting for her life. But at 6.58 p.m., Melissa Suplat was pronounced dead. The autopsy showed that Melissa's cause of death was traumatic brain injury. It also documented various other injuries in different stages of healing, but there would have been plenty of injuries that weren't noted because she'd been in the hospital for nine weeks at this point. So some of her injuries would have completely healed in that time. It definitely didn't show a full picture of the damage done to her. This meant that the manner of death was undetermined. This ruling is what her family have been fighting to have changed. They wanted Joey charged because all the medical professionals who had worked on Melissa had made notes to the effect of her injuries being caused by a beating. Melissa's mum had received a call soon after Melissa was hospitalised and the anonymous caller told her that Joey Tyndall had a history of domestic violence against women. They went on to say he was a very dangerous man, but he seemed to always get away with whatever he did. So this person urged Marion to keep pushing for justice in Melissa's case. When Marion gave this information to the police, interview Joey's ex-wives. They spoke with his first wife, Kathy Adams, who Joey had two sons with. They divorced in September of 2001 after Joey pointed a gun at her and their children. He was then married to his second wife, Jamie Duff, in March of 2002. It didn't take long for this marriage to go south. Jamie filed and was granted a protection from abuse order from Joey because, according to her, he'd attacked her and grabbed her by her hair, threw her against the washer and threatened her with a gun. He then threw a number of things at her before he grabbed her again and threw her outside. She wound up having to get medical help for her injuries. The judge, in that case, very helpfully told Joey to stay away from her for a week. You really can't make this stuff up. So that is two women from his past telling corroborating stories of violence. Court documents to further back this up, and yet police are seemingly still buying Joey's she fell down and I was looking after her by keeping her hydrated with alcohol and feeding her story. At one stage, he told them that he'd fed her a nice meatloaf dinner the night before she was taken to the hospital. Um, okay, I can pretty much guarantee that if he did in fact feed her meatloaf, it would have been to torture her, not to nourish her. Making her chew with a jaw that was broken in two places would have been excruciating. He also told them a couple of different stories about why he didn't take her to the hospital. Firstly, he said that she didn't want to go that she'd been to the hospital enough and she just didn't want to go. And then later on, he said he didn't call for an ambulance because he'd called so many times before that he didn't think they'd come. Yeah, so that's not, in case anyone's wondering, that's not how emergency services work. Okay. When they looked further into Joey's background, they found that he wasn't only abusive to his partners, but also to his own mother as he was growing up. The abuse was verbal, mental, and physical. Apparently, he was so bad that his mum was too scared to even go to the hospital or the police for fear of the repercussions. This abuse also extended to his children. He would slap them and punch them. The children also told police about the abuse they witnessed their father inflicting on their mother. So all of this is being told to these police and they can see the damage that's been done to this, this poor woman and yet nothing is being done. One of Joey's sons had stayed with Joey and Melissa for a time and he told police of the verbal and mental abuse he witnessed. He said he didn't see any physical abuse at that time but he did see his dad go up behind Melissa and point a finger like a garden at her head and mime like he was shooting her. And after him having aimed a gun at both his ex-wives and Melissa having actually been shot at some point, this is really disturbing. 
a definite pattern that was showing up through the interviews with Joey's ex-wives was the fact that they were made to lie and say that they were clumsy and fell down a lot. Sounds a lot like the reason Melissa gave for her injuries, doesn't it? That is the power of manipulation and coercion. The manipulator's words become your own, both internally and externally. So as much as the family wanted Joey charged with the assault and causing Melissa's death, at this point they would have been relieved to know he was at least being charged with neglecting to get medical assistance for her. The Attorney General eventually did say that they believed that Joey was responsible for Melissa's injuries and subsequent death, but they had no proof. And if they charged him for negligence, which is a misdemeanor, he would probably only get probation. And then if they did find any evidence to charge him with for the homicide, their hands would be tied. Now, I don't know if I necessarily believe that line of waffle because it's been 13 years and to this point they've done nothing. They haven't attempted to get any further evidence or work towards charging him with anything. That does seem to be about to change though. Like I said earlier, Melissa's case has finally officially been reopened. Chief Deputy Ryan Dawson at the Lenore County Sheriff's Office told a reporter that they have new information and leads that they're working on that he couldn't comment any further. On the Justice for Melissa Facebook page, Melissa's sister Michelle wrote that Melissa's death certificate had been amended from undetermined to homicide, with the cause of death being assault from a closed head injury. She goes on to say having a death certificate changed is not very common at all, but well-respected medical professionals, including multiple medical examiners and forensic pathologists reviewed the case the private investigator had put together and 100% of them agree that it's homicide. All case info has been turned over to Chief Deputy Ryan Dawson of Lenore County, North Carolina. And once Deputy Dawson is finished processing, it will be turned over to the DA Matt Delbridge of Lenore County, who's ultimately the one who will decide if charges will be brought. They were also able to have a new medical examiner look at everything and they determined homicide by assault as well. These posts were put up on the 28th of October and the 4th of November. So this case is currently being revived and re-examined. Things were not investigated as thoroughly as they could have been at the time that this happened. And I can only hope that it will be handled properly this time around. My thoughts and prayers are with the family. They have been waiting so long for justice and I hope they will see it really soon. If you have any information that may help in this case, please contact law enforcement. I've listed the Justice for Melissa Platt Facebook page link in the show notes and the description box along with the link to the GoFundMe. If the content of this case has raised any concerns for you regarding your own relationship or that of a loved one, please reach out for help. There is a list of resources in the show notes and the description box below. As always, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this case. Also, please don't forget to like and subscribe, rate and review, and drop a comment below for my friends watching on YouTube. Also, let's continue this discussion over on social media. Join us on Twitter at Love Trap Pod or Instagram at Surviving the Love Bomb. Trapped by Love is a Surviving the Love Bomb production. If you'd like more information about recognizing abusive relationships, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, Surviving the Love Bomb. You can also watch these podcasts on the Trapped by Love YouTube channel. I believe this is a really important topic that needs more exposure so we can all stay safe from abusive relationships. Well, friends, that's all I have for you today. I thank you for joining me this week. And until next time, please take care of yourselves and be kind to one another. Bye.